Hey, I just wanted to quickly plug that if you guys want any tutoring, some new slots have opened. If you look in the description, there's a link to my physics and maths tutor profile in which I do tutoring on there. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the A-Level Cookbook. Today we're going to be doing OCR A-Level Chemistry A, Paper 2 from June 2019. So now it says, which alkane has the highest boiling point? So these are all alkanes. Boiling point depends on the forces between the molecules, which are intermolecular forces, of which there are London forces. So whichever one of these is this just a straight chain alkane that's really, really fat is going to be it, which is A. Not really going to be B because that's got branches and bits and bobs sticking off of it. Here as well, it's got um, more branches here as well and stuff like that. So immediately it's A. So butane reacts with chlorine in the presence of UV radiation to form a mixture of organic products. Which equation shows a propagation step? So propagation is where you get a radical reacting with a non-radical to make um, another radical and a non-radical. So basically the entire idea is that because you're, regener you're making a radical at the end of that first reaction, it's going to go then attack another thing and you get this chain reaction going. So immediately this one's out, because that's initiation. That one's termination, because radical, radical makes non-radical. So then here, it's some, one of these two possibly, right? Now when this reacts with a Cl radical, um, that's gonna take off an H from there. It's not this one, because in the first propagation state, this chlorine radical will react with a CH bond, and it will form this thing becoming the radical, and then an HCl, which is not the case. It's that one, that one's out, so it's D. It says, what's the name of this compound below? So all you do is you find the longest chain. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's six, which means it's going to be probably one of the hex somethings, right? So immediately you're out and you're out. Next, what we need to do is we need to make this like, like the in part, the smallest number possible. So our options are two in and four in, right? So that was one, two, three, four in, or one, two, e, in, because that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six. So immediately it's got to be C, because we want that to be the lowest number. So structure of a stereoisomer is shown below. Which term correctly describes the stereoisomer? So here we've got two different groups and we've got two different groups. If we have a look, the higher priority stuff is on the opposite sides. Can you see how that's here, like the other higher priority bits here and versus here and here? Now, because there's four different groups and there's no hydrogens, you don't need the one of them like this, it's gonna be E instead of um, trans. So there you go. So it says, which type of bonds are broken and formed in the reaction of ethene and bromine? So if we have a thing, ethene, right? It's going to have a C double one C and that's going to break down eventually to form CC. But in the same sense, bromine is going to be BR, BR, which eventually will become, you know, CBR and CBR, right? So we're breaking a pi bond immediately there, but we're also going to be breaking a sigma bond here. So it's going to be pi and sigma, so you're out and you're out. Cool, so now we're stuck with these two, right? Now the bond formed, you can see that's a single bond here. It's going to be sigma, it's not going to be pi, so it's D. There you go. Reason being is because that pi bond is for C double one C, double one alkenes. So now it says, what's the organic product of the reaction below? So we're adding OH, right? In this, it's going to be OH minus. It's got a lone pair, and you can see there's a lovely CL there, so it's going to do this, right? It's going to come here, and it's going to boot the CL off like that. That's nucleophilic substitution. It's not going to go for this one, because this is benzene, and there's a C there. It doesn't behave the same way. So in that case, it's going to be whichever one is the same, except this is now an OH instead, which would be A. There you go. Can't be U, because this is the carbon on the benzene, and it's not actually as electron deficient, so it's not going to do that. That's out. Here as well. Um... This has swapped both of them. So although this one's correct, this one isn't, so that's out. And here, why would it go on a benzene? What's the incentive for the OH minus to go along and, you know, come to this carbon? That's actually quite happy electron-wise, so that's out. So now it says, what's the number of chiral carbons in this molecule below? All you got to do is just go through it bit by bit and see what's chiral or not. So this has a double bond, that's out. This one's not chiral, that's not chiral. This is going to have, um, what's that going to be, CH2, that's not chiral. That's a CH2, that's not chiral. This is going to be chiral, because it's got an H, and then three, you know, three other things coming off of it. That's not chiral, that's not chiral. This is going to be chiral because there's different things on it and an H there and this one as well, three different things and an H. That's not chiral, that's not chiral. This one definitely is. This one's also chiral. Then uh, here, that's not chiral. It's got two H's, that's not chiral. And this one's chiral. So that's one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so it's going to be B. So it says phenol reacts with bromine. What is the least likely organic product? So when you've got an OH on a benzene, what that means is it's going to be two, four directing meaning that whatever you're adding to it is going to preferentially go for the two and the four carbon, right? So we need to just find whichever one is least likely to fit the bill there. So if we have a look, that's going to be our first one. So that's two, three, four, that's two, four. So that's out here. That's going to be two, three, four, five, six. That's still still two, four directing as well, because six, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's still going to be the same thing. So nope, because that's two, four as well. It, so here, it's 2,4 direct as well, there's 2 here, and it also can do that, and you can get tri-bromophenol um, as well, so that one's out. And here, 1, 2, 3, the 3 is looking pretty strong because we don't get a 3, so that's a possible one. Here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it's not this one because that's the actual reaction that happens when you mix the two together, and it's very likely that happens, and it's 2,4 directing as well, so that means it's got to be C. 
Now, the repeat union of a polymer is shown below. You should immediately be able to see that there is a C double bond OO here, which means it must be a polyester, which means an alcohol and a COOH carboxylic acid made this originally. So what we must have had is we must have had this, a two carbon alcohol, right? Or a diol, because we're going to have two ends on this. And you can see there's two C double bond O's here. So it's going to have to be a dicarboxylic acid on this end with two carbons in it as well. So whichever one fits the bill. So this is two carbons, it's a diol, so that's good. And that's a one, two... You know, and then, well, there's two, two carboxylic acid groups, remember, so four there. So one, two, three, four, two carboxylic acids. That's looking pretty good, too. So it's probably going to be, it is probably, it is just A. But if we have a look at the others, one, two, three, that's got two carbons, so you're immediately wrong. One, two, three, that's, a, again, wrong. Here, one, two, three, and it's a carboxylic acid with um, an OH on the other end, which is incorrect as well. This is going to be, what, one, two, three, four. Um, that could be feasible. This one's going to be one, two, three. That's not, that's not right. And then one, two. That's out as well. And also there's an, an alcohol and a carboxylic acid group. Here, again, because there's an ester link and it's a polymer, you know that it's going to have to have been a diol here and a C double bond OOH here, like carboxylic acid on there. There you go. So now it says, which one shows four peaks in its carbon 30 vanilla spectrum? So four peaks means four carbon environments. So one, two, that's the same as that. Two, three, here, three, four, five. So that's out. So this is going to be one. That's going to be the same as that. So that's one. This is two. There's two. That's the same. There's three. There's three. And there's four. There's four. So it's going to be B. The student reacts 4.5 grams of this with excess CH3 COC on this reaction below, and it gives you um, C6H5 NHCOCH3 plus HCl. And then it says the reaction produces this much. What is the percentage yield of that? Fine. So what we need to do is we need to find out the expected amount first, the, you know, the theoretical amount. So we're going to work out the moles of the C6H5 NH2, which is going to just be 4.50 divided by its MR of 93, which if I do that, we get 0.04838, right? So then we can use that to work out the expected mass or the theoretical of the product, which is our, you know, CE6H5 blah, 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 which is going to be its mat mole times MR, which is going to be 0.048387, that should really be, times 135. If I do that, we get 6.532 grams. However, they've told us that this reaction actually makes this. So our percentage yield is going to be 3.25 divided by 6.532, whatever, right, times 100. So if I do 3.25 divided by the answer, times it by 100, I end up getting 49.75, which is A. So now it says a compound produces this carbon-13 NMR spectrum below, which compound could have made this spectrum? So if we have a look, we've got, if you look at your data sheet, the peak that corresponds to this has got to be CO, or it could be CNs and stuff. But here you can see that there's only, um, you know, CHs and O's in this, right? So then we need to do is we need to go through all of these and knock them out into which ones, which, which ones probably not going to be likely. So C double bond, so propane has no oxygens in, that wouldn't explain that peak, so that's immediately out. And the same for 2-methyl butane, right? Two, so 2 methyl propane one all, one, two, three, and there's an OH here. And then there's a 2-methyl here, right? CH3, whatever. So there's one carbon environment, because that would be a CH3, that's a CH3, that's the same as this one. So that's also one, two, three. That's three carbon environments, it's C. You compare it to D, one, two, three, if we did 2 methyl propane 2 all, that's one environment, that's one, and that's one, and that's two. So you'd only get two there. So that one's out. It's totally C. Now, carbonyl is reacted with NABH4. What compounds could be made? So if we're reacting any carbonyl, what you're going to end up making is you're going to be able to make an alcohol again. However, there's a bit of a limit on what you could make because you have to remember that you will have, if you're using a carbonyl, that's C double bond O, right? So some of these might not be possible. For example, 2-methylpentyl 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? 2-methyl, so there's a C here, pentan 2 all. If, we, if this was a carbonyl, the original carbonyl that would have come from is this, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 bonds, which is impossible. So you've got to check like that, right? So that one's out because it, you can't get a tertiary alcohol eventually becoming a carbonyl. It's not possible. 2-methylpentyl 1 all. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2 methyls here, and then there's a C double one. Oh, that is possible. And then 3-methylpentyl 2 all. So that would be like what the carbonyl group would have been 3 methyl pentan 2 So it would have been originally here and then a methyl here, which is also possible. So it's 2 and 3, which means it's C. Which chemicals can we react for phenol? So phenol can act as a weak acid, so it can react, react with strong bases, so you're in. And then as well as that, ethanoyl chloride. Remember that acyl chlorides, you can use um, acyl, Friedel-Crafts acylation or um, acylation if you want to, if you, you know, it depends what exam board you do, they call it different things. How that can become an electrophile eventually, right? So that can become this, and then you can react it with... Um, benzene or phenol as well in an electrophilic substitution reaction, so that's correct. Nitric acid, same thing, you can do nitration of benzene with it, so that's also correct. So that means the option is, it's A. So structure of a compound is used to treat influenza here, so it says which functional groups is or are present in a molecule of this. So there's an alkene here, there is a double bond OOC, COOC, right? That's an ester, so there's an ester there. Now it says secondary amide, so secondary a an amide is always a C double bond O and H, right? 
and then some, and it could be like NH2 or whatever. So if it's a secondary amide, it means it's, this N has had two things substituted on it like that. So if we have a look, C double bond O, NH, and there's two substituted things, so that's definitely there. And a ketone is always a mid-chain thing like this with a double bond O, and then this. There isn't anything there. That double bond O is next to an OCH as part of the ester link, and that's not a double bond O. So that means there's no ketone here, so it's only 1 and 2, which is B. So this question is about unsaturated aldehydes and alcohol. So 3-methylbut2-inal is shown as and it's used as a food coloring. So 3-methylbut2-inal is reacted with hydrogen bromide, forming a mixture of two organic compounds. One of this is made in a much greater quantity than the other. Outline the reaction mechanism for the formation of one of the organic products. Identify curly arrows and relevant dipoles. So here, just as a quick side note, the thing that we're going to be reacting with is HBr, and this is an alkene. So we're going to get electrophilic addition. Now the one that's going to be the major product is the one that has more R groups on it which is going to be this one because it has more alkyl groups on it. So when you're drawing a mechanism, don't just memorize arrows and be like, oh my God, I need to draw this and this and this and this. Like think about what's happening when you're doing it, right? So if I draw my alkene here, so C, double bond C, and then the CHO, the H, the H3C, the H3C, right? And we're act reacting with HBr. Now HBr is pretty chill until it starts getting near these very electron heavy double bonds. Because then what happens is it puts a dipole. Remember, that's a covalent bond. If these electrons are floating nearby, it's going to repel the electrons, and that's what puts a dipole here like this. So then you end up having a delta negative Br and a delta positive H, right? Then what happens is electrons are given to this delta positive H, but the problem is now it's got too many bonds. It's got one here and one here, and it only wants one. So now we have to boot something off. So this Br gets booted off like that and takes the electron pair. And the way I like to think of it is imagine that, like I said before, the electrons are really close here. These electrons now getting, you know, these electrons now getting to the H is pushing it even further to the point where it's practically on the Br like that. So then what you end up getting is you get C, C with a carbocation, CHO, H, H3C, H3C. Actually, I'm going to put the H here. Sorry, I'll put the carb, I'm going to swap the carbocation around. H, you can do, you can do either because it's not asking you for the major, but I'm just going to draw the major anyway, right? And this Br has now got an extra pair of electrons, so it's Br minus. So then what happens is this Br minus gives its electron pair to this carbon that's positive, right? So it technically acts as a nucleophile in this sense, actually, because it's giving an electron pair away. Electrophiles, remember, are things that are attracted to electrons. Electrophile, philia, like audiophile. Attraction to audio, like audio, right? So we need to, gen this whole step is to generate the actual electrophile and actually get it going and doing its job. So then here, the next thing is you end up making your product, which is H3C, C, B, R, H3C, C, C, H, O, H, H, there you go. Now it says, explain why one of the organic products forms in a much greater quantity than the other. The reason being is because the one state, uh, one carbocation is more stable because it has more alkyl groups. There you go. So geranium oil and citronella are shown below, and they're isomers present in citronella oil, and they're used as an insect repellent. So here we've got an alkene group, we've got an alkene group, we've got an alcohol, we've got an alkene group, and we've got a, an aldehyde. So geraniol and citronellal are structural isomers of each other. They also show stereoisomerism. Describe how observations from a chemical test could be used to distinguish between the two of them. So what we could do is we could... There's two options. Either one, we could add 2,4-DNP and we get an orange precipitate, or we could use Tollens reagent. So I'm just going to pick Tollens reagent. The reason is, is because that's an aldehyde, so it can get oxidized with Tollens reagent. With um, an alcohol, you can't really do it. With Tollens reagent, you'd have to use acidified potassium dichromate, blah, 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 in that sense. So when you add Tollens reagent, what ends up, what ends up happening is you get a silver mirror form. Maybe you need to say why, right? Silver mirror forms indicating an aldehyde. There you go. So then it says, what's the molecular formula of geraniol? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's 10 carbons, right? Uh, so 10 carbons, so it's C10. Hydrogens, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So H18, and then O, just one O there. There you go. Explain why geraniol and citronella are structural isomers of each other. It's because they have the same molecular formula, but different structural formula. There you go. So now it says explain the term stereoisomerism. It's where you have the same structural formula, sorry, but different arrangement of atoms in space. There you go. So the structures of geraniol and citronella are repeated with the carbon atoms numbered. Explain the types of stereoisomerism shown by geraniol and citronella. And in your answer, refer to the numbered carbocations on the structure above and then draw any diagrams showing them. So the iso stereoisomerism we're looking out for essentially is either optical or, um, or um, EZ, right? Now here, there's a double bond here, but this is the same. On, there's two same groups on this carbon, so there can't be any um, EZ isomerism there. So that doesn't have any. Here though, there's this whole, there's that group. There's this whole thing here. There's this whole thing here. And then there's an H there. So there is stereoisomerism there. There is EZ isomerism. Here there isn't because they're the same as well. So off the bat, we can say that geraniol has EZ isomerism. And you need to say why due to 
the um, double bond at three, sorry, three and two, having carbons with two different groups on each, right? Now, they've given you the E isomer. Can you see how that's high priority, high priority? This is the high priority, but that's higher than this one. So the higher priority ones are on either side, right? We need to draw the Z isomer. So all you do is you draw the same thing again and you just flip it the other way. The start, oh, here, there's a space there, how convenient. So if we draw that, if you draw that, it'd be the same thing, but just flipped on the other side. So it would be this. There you go. Now with citronellal, there's no EZ isomerism, but we need to look for, and they've also hinted at in the question that the stereo isomer is in the other. So there clearly has to be a chiral carbon for an optical isomer to form, because there's the two types that happen in organic stuff. So we need to go look for that. So you're not chiral, you're not chiral, you're not chiral, you're not chiral. You're not chiral because it's two hydrogens. You're not chiral because it's two hydrogens. This is three hydrogens. So there's not. You're not chiral either. But here we've got this whole chunk here. We've got that whole chunk here. We've got that methyl and a hydrogen off here. So this one's chiral. If that's chiral, then what we're going to end up having is we're going to have optical isomerism. So then you would say that in citronellal, at carbon three, there is optical isomerism because it is a chiral carbon. So when you're drawing your chiral centers skeletally. What you can just do is you just replace the straight lines of the wedges and stuff where needed. So in this sense, it's going to be the exact same thing for here, like so. But then instead of, so one of them is going to be like a straight line as well. That's going to be a dashed line and then a wedge. And then the rest of it is sort of like that. You can do that. Or you could draw the whole thing out as well. Then, because it's optical isomerism, it's a mirror image. So on the other side, you just draw the mirror image of what you've just done here. So then there, there. Oh, this is going to be tricky. There, there, there. Uh, there, 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 there. The reason I've added the H in there is to show that there's four different groups clearly, and you need to do that. So this question is about alpha amino acids here, um, and it says, here's the R groups of four amino acids. In the boxes below, draw the organic products of the reactions of serine shown below. So we've got serine here. Now we're adding H pluses. If you have lots and lots of H pluses, remember that this is an amine group, which means it can behave as a base, because it's got that lone pair that we can give to an H plus. That's one of them. Here, this is an acid. So if we're adding excess acid, it's not going to give out an H+, it's going to accept a proton, it's going to act as a base, right? So then what happens is, we end up having um, this thing basically, which is an NH3+, on the other side. So it's going to be H3N+, plus CH, CH2, OH, and then C double bond O, OH. This is unaffected because it's nice and acidic. Here, we've added this stuff here, so we need to think about what we've added we've added an alcohol and an acid. So what it's going to end up doing is because there's a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, we're going to be making an ester through a condensation reaction. Every single condensation reaction leading to an ester, an ester link always looks like this with a C there. So then what happens is we will just have these two joined together. So it would be H2N, C, H, CH2, OH, right? And then it's going to be C double bond O, O, and then this whole, sorry, whoops, this whole bit there. So CH, CH3, 2, like that. Now here, we are adding CH3, C double bond OCL, and it's an excess. So CH3, C double bond OCL means we're adding an acyl chloride, because you should be able to recognize it's this. So if we're adding an acyl chloride, it's going to react with, because it's a carboxylic acid derivative, it's going to react with similar things to a carboxylic acid. So it's going to react with this to make an ester again. So we're going to get a C double bond O, O, C. And then here, it's going to react with this to make an amide. So an amide is C double bond O and H, right? So all you do is you just glue them on together like that. So in this case, it's going to be start with your C. That's going to stay the same. And the C double bond O, O, H is going to stay the same. The H here is the same. It's going to be CH2. And then it's going to be an ester link. And then the rest of this, it's going to be O, um, O, C, H, 3, C, like that. Or you could draw out the double bonds if you wanted as well. It's fine. And then here, we will have a C o, double bond O and H. So it's going to be N, H and then the rest of this, so CH3CO, like that. So students provided with one of the four amino acids in this table, they carry out titration with a standard solution of hydrochloric acid to identify the amino acid, and their method is done below. So please read the text that they give you. Don't just jump straight into working out molds. Like, it's just so many people just do not get, like, these questions right because they just don't read the question. This is reading comprehension. You learn it in, like, primary school. Use it. Right? So what I mean by that is they've dissolved 5.766 grams of the amino acid of water and made it up to a, a solution, right? So from that, I'm taking that there's 5.7, was that, 66 grams, this mysterious amino acid in 250 centimeters cubed. Then the student titrates this solution with 25 centimeters cubed of this much, right? So here, they've taken some amount of this and then reacted it with 25 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid. 
So I know that I'm adding HCl plus this amino acid mixture thing, and it's 25 centimeters cubed of it. 25 centimeters cubed, 0 0.150 moles per decimeter cubed. Like you write your, you know, things that you need down. V, C, cool. Still don't know anything about the amino acid. However, it says that this much of the amino acid solution was required for the complete neutralization of this. So now I know that the volume of this amino acid solution they took from this original thing is 21.30, right? Loads of people just jumped straight into this, blindly worked out things, got like m multiple marks lost, and then tried doing the factor of timesing it by 10 because they immediately thought, oh, 25 to 2 or 50. It's like, use your, you know, you, you got, come on, you guys got to learn how to read and use it properly, yeah? And it says determine which amino acid they used. So in order to work out the amino acid here and using the mass of this thing and all of this stuff, we're going to have to be using their moles and their MRs and all that jazz, right? So all the time, you should always sketch out a quick equation as well on what's happening every single time, even if you don't get one. In this case, it's going to be HCl plus an amino, this, whatever this amino acid is makes whatever and whatever, right? I just want to check that they're in a one-to-one -one ratio or a one-to-two or whatever, right? This HCl is going to react with the, uh, the NH2 part here, the H3N part, whatever, right? H1 plus, right? So that means it's going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. That's fine. Then I can work out the moles of the HCl. I'm now going to find the moles of this HCl. I'll know how many moles were in this 21.3 centimeters cubed thing. I can work backwards, find out how much is in 250, get the, I've got the mass, I've got the moles. I can work out the MR and then I can go figure out what it is. So the moles of the HCl is going to be, it's concentration times volume, so 0 0.150 times 25 over 1,000. If we do that, we end up getting 3.75 times 10 to the minus three moles. Since they react in a one-to-one -one ratio, as we've established, the moles of the amino acid is also going to be 3.75 times 10 to the minus three moles, right? So then that's in 21.3 centimeters cubed. So the moles of the amino acid in the 250 would be 3.75 times 10 to the minus three times the 250 divided by the 21.3 to find the scale factor. Because if it was 250 and it was 20, you had 25 and it's 250, then you would just times it by 10, 250 over 25. In this case, it's not. It's that they've actually used 21.3, and this has purposely been put there to screw you guys over because you guys don't read the question. And you're like, oh my god, I got it wrong. If you do that, you end up getting 0 0.0440 moles. Cool. Now I know what the mass of this amino acid was. I can work out its MR by doing MR equals mass over moles, which is going to be the mass they gave us, which was what, 5.766. So 5.766, all divided the mole by the moles, which is 0 0.0440, and you get the MR of 131 grams per mole. Now, we know that every amino acid in the universe fits this first. It has a C, C, O, O, H, H, um, 2, N, H, and then an R group, right? So then the R group is going to be this, take away the MR of everything else. So the MR of the R group is going to equal 131 minus, well, that's 14 plus 2, so that's 14 plus 2 plus 12 plus 1 plus 12 plus 16, 16, so plus uh, 16 plus 16 plus 1. The MR of this R group has got to be... 57. So now we know the MR of this is with 57, we need to go look back at the table and see which one fits the bill. So the R group that fits 57, if you work out all the MRs, I'm just going to skip ahead and do it because I've done this before about billion times this question, it's going to be this, lacine. So therefore, the amino acid is lacine. These titration questions are really not that spicy. Like a lot of people get panicked and scared about them being like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I don't know the method. There is no the method. The method is to read it and look at it and use a bit of common sense. Chemistry is all about things interacting with each other as in molecules and particles and atoms and this and that smacking into each other and doing things, right? So you need to figure out what they're actually doing when they're reacting. This HCl is gonna be neutralizing well, it's going to have a neutralization reaction with the amino acid because it's going to accept the base and all of this, blah, 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 right? Because there's an NH2 bit in there. They're going to react in a one-to-one -one ratio, and then you need to figure out working backwards. You cannot go through this, jumping back and forth over and over again and trying to figure things out and trying to be capped in big nuts. It don't work. Read it carefully. Pinpoint each sentence what everything means. The student titrates this solution with 25 centimeters cubed of this. That doesn't mean there's 25 centimeters cubed of amino acid solution because it says with 25 centimeters cubed of this thing. Right, and then 21.3 centimeters cubed of the amino acid solution. So it's like, use your reading comprehension. I promise using your brain's good for you. So students provided with another amino acid. They attempt to identify this unknown amino acid using chromatography. They get two TLC chromatograms of the unknown amino acids for the four amino acids in this table using two different solvents, W and X. So what's the RF value of the serine one in W? So if you have a look at W, that's that, right? So the RF value is going to be the distance of the spot divided by the distance to the solvent front, right? Now, if we do that, um, all you would do is like, you would just measure from there to the solvent front and then there to that, and then you divide the two, and you would end up getting 0 0.33 or something like that, just because um, I can't really measure this because it's a bit janky my whiteboard. Then it says, analyze a chromatogram to identify the unknown amino acid and identify your reasoning. So if we have a look, 
We have some mysterious unknown amino acid here. We have some mysterious unknown amino acid. Chill. And we have done well. We've put unknown amino acids and four amino acids using these two different groups here. So in these two different solvents, we can see that this amino acid is matching these two. So it could either be, sorry, with lysine or glycine. But here it's matching with alanine and glycine. Because glycine is common to both of those, it's going to be glycine. Reason is, is because you use different solvents, they'll move different amounts due to differing amounts of solubility. That's why they've done two, because it's to help distinguish between, you know, which of these two it is. Although it matches these two here, it didn't match alanine here, did it? So that means by, it has to be glycine. So that's what you would say, is that the identity is going to be glycine. Why? It's because it's matching, um, you know, gl uh, glycine in W and X. There you go. So this question is about esters. The structure of ester A is shown below. What is the systematic name for this? So we need to look at the carboxylic acid derivative and that'll give you a suffix, the end part. And then the bit before it will be, you know, the other part. So what I mean by that is every ester in the world, the C double bond OOC, right? Where this bits come from a carboxylic acid. You see the C double bond here. So this is the carboxylic acid part, right? So there's one, two, three carbons there. So we know it's going to be propanoate because it was a derivative of a carboxylic acid. So propanoate, right? Now here, there's a one, two, three, there's a bromo there, so it's gonna be three bromo propanoate. So that's the first bit, right? Now, the other part is the, the ester is the alcohol that originally came on here. So it's a one, two carbon thing. So it's going to be ethyl three bromo propanoate. There you go. In the boxes below, draw the organic products of the reactions of the functional groups in ester A shown below, and then each reaction forms two organic products. So here we are adding H plus, which means we're going to be doing acid hydrolysis of this, which means you're putting a water back into this to break it back down into its original constituents. Now, esters are made from alcohols and carboxylic acids. So this bit here must have become eventually a um, carboxylic acid, and this part would have been the alcohol part. So in this case, this would just literally be the same thing, be Br, this, 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 C double bond O, but then an OH, because it's a carboxylic acid again. And then this would have just been an alcohol, which would just be HO and then that. There you go. Now here, we're adding excess OH minus. So it's going to do hydrolysis again, but instead of making the carboxylic acid, we're going to make a carboxylate salt, which means this is going to stay the same. You're still going to have an HO here like this, but rather than having an actual carboxylic acid, it's going to become O minus. But however, there's another caveat to this. I like using the word. I've never used the word caveat in normal talk. Wow. Another problem though, is that they've also added excess of this. So you need to be able to look at this and identify what else might happen with it. So we definitely know we're making a carboxylate salt with this part. There's a Br here. That's C, Br. We're adding OH minus. Nucleophilic substitution is going to do this and this. So that means as well as that, not only have we made a carboxylate salt, we've actually swapped the Br off for the OH now. So now we have HO, this, 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 this. But instead of an OH here, it'd be an O minus like that. There you go. So now excess generally hints at the fact there's more things happening in these kinds of things. Not always, but just be wary that you need to see if there's anything else that could possibly react with in here. Now it says, name the type of the reactions happening. Well, I've just said it before, it was hydrolysis. There you go. So the products in ester A in four different environments, labeled one to four, complete the table to predict the proton NMR spectra of this. So we need to look at the chemical shifts using the data sheet. So if you get your data sheet out, so here it says, complete the table to predict the proton NMR spectrum of this ester A. So what we've got, I've got a copy of it up here, is we need to look for every single bit and one by one. Now I've accidentally put this conveniently over the numbers. So let me just fix that, whoops. Right, so here what we're gonna do is we'll look at this first one. So this is a CH2 next to a CH2 with a Br. This hydrogen, like these two hydrogens, sorry, were picked up this environment. So we need to look for the environment here that corresponds to a carbon with a Br next to it or an alkyl next to it as well, an alkyl group. So if that's the case, we're gonna be looking at roughly, well, there's a Br here, so it's this one. Now it's not gonna be like the O or anything because there's nothing else here. It's not gonna be Cl, there's no Cl. It's gonna be this one because it's a hydrogen with a carbon that's attached to a bromine, which is exactly that, hydrogen attached to a carbon with a bromine. So that means its chemical shift is going to be within that range. So 3.0 to 4.3. Now, splitting pattern is dependent on what's next to it. So the adjacent carbon having this many uh, hydrogens with that lovely N plus one rule. So if you look at this hydrogen environment, the adjacent carbon, well, there's no adjacent carbon on this side, but here, the carbon that it's adjacent to has two. So that means it has to be a triplet. The N plus one rule says that the adjacent carbon will have N by one less than the number of peaks. So if it's a triplet, then the adjacent carbon will have one less. So that's why it's two, or n plus one means that the number of you know, splitting would be the number of hydrogens plus one, n plus one. So for number two, we can see that there's a C with two, with two H's on. So this is the environment that's picked on. It's attached to a C, which is attached to another C, which is attached to another C, and it's attached to an O. It's gonna be this one, because this is the hydrogen in bold. The one in bold is the one that's picked up, and that's the one that's been picked up, attached to a carbon, which is attached to a C double bond O. 
which is attached to a carbon, which is attached to a seed of a 1, oh. So that means here, that chemical shift is going to be 2.0 to 3.0. So now it's splitting pattern. It's the number of hydrogens adjacent on, on the adjacent carbon. So this is the peak that was found. Here, can you see there's no hydrogens, but here there are two. So therefore, this is going to be a triplet as well. Cool. Now, if you look at the next one, this is the hydrogens that we picked up. It's next to a C bonded to an O, and it's next to a C, this C is also bonded to a C. So whichever one fits the bill is going to be that. So we've got HC bonded to an O. These H's were bonded to the C, which is bonded to an O. So it's this one here. So it's going to be within what, like 3 to 4.3, right? Now here then, if you have a look, the adjacent carbon, well, there is no adjacent carbon here. The adjacent carbon is all the way over there, and there's no hydrogens on it. But here, there's three. So that means this one's got to be a quartet. And number four, this is the hydrogen environment that was picked up. It's bonded to a C, right? So in that case, it's going to be just this boring one here. And there's an H there. These are the H's that are picked up. So it's going to have a chemical shift of, like, what, 0 0.5 to, like, I don't know, 2.0. And it is um, next to it, adjacent carbon S2, so it's a triplet. There you go. A lot of people made the mistake of saying, for example, here, that there's none because this has not got any hydrogens on it because it's an oxygen or this has got no hydrogens on it, blah, blah, blah. You've got to look both sides, not just one. So compound B is a structural isomer of ester A, which is this thing here. It reacts with aqueous sodium carbonate. Fine. Now, because it reacts with aqueous sodium carbonate, to me, that's telling me that it's going to have a COOH because this is a carbonate. And, you know, we've got, we've got C's and O's and H's. We're going to have a carboxylic acid there. It's also told you that it's got four peaks, which means it's got four carbon environments. A lot of people just kind of overlook this and are just like, okay, well, I'm going to ignore that now, which is a bit weird. It's like, that's still important. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. We've got, uh, we've got one bromine as well. And then, well, how many oxygens are we allowed? Two oxygens, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by drawing the carboxylic acid group because that's the bit that's, you know, hinging around all of this. So C double bond O, O. H. And this is carbon 13, so we have one environment there. I need to use up the rest of the, the what, um, four carbons, and I only have three environments left to in, spread them around with. So what I might do is I might put a carbon here, and then try and methyl group it, if that makes sense. I'll put some methyl groups here, CH3, CH3. That's one, two, three, four. And I've got one more carbon left, so I can try putting that one there. Maybe this could work, maybe this might not, right? I need to stick a BR on here somewhere as well. I'm going to put a BR there, and then an H, and an H. Then you test this. So I mean, the formula is in keeping, that's pretty all right. Um, you can go and add it up yourself, but I, I just, just for sake of time, I've already gone and worked that out um, and chopped it out. But then here as well, the number of carbon environments, test it. So that's one carbon environment here. That's two, but that's the same as that one. So that's two, that's three, and that's four. And you've got all the atoms in there, so that's it, it's chill. A polyester is formed from 200 molecules of 4-hydroxybenzoic acid. What is the relative MR of that? So think of it this way, right? So one ester link made means you're going to have one H2O lost, right? So if we're joining 200 of them, we're going to lose. So remember, this is ester link, right? This is two monomers, give you one of them, right? So if we've got 200 molecules of these, then we're going to have 200 of these joined together, right? But each one loses one H2O. So what we're going to end up with is if two molecules loses one H2O, then 200 of these monomers, can you see it's one less? It's going to be 199 of them lost, 199 H2Os lost because the outer bonds aren't going to be open like that, if that makes sense. It's a polyester made from this. So then what you do is you work out the MR of the 4-hydroxy, blah, 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 whatever, right? Which in this case, um, of the 4-hydroxy benzoic acid, is uh, 138. They've told you it's 200 of them, so times 200. If you do that, you get 27600. Zero, zero. But we lost this many waters, remember, so it's going to be 27600 zero, zero, minus 18 lots of, well, sorry, 199 lots of 18. There you go. It's the same thing, but it just looks nicer. Then you get 24018. There you go. So just remember to factor in that. The reason it's not 200 waters is because if it was 200 waters, it would be whatever this thing is, blah, blah, blah. You know, C double bond O, and then this would be open, and then blah, 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 blah. C double bond. Oh, sorry, not C double bond O. It would just be C O, blah, blah, blah. It's not. It's closed off at the end here like this because it's a polyester. It's finished doing its polymerization. It's not. The other one would be if you were to draw like an entire repeat unit, and in that case, it would be 200. But because these are done, finished, closed off, and they're not open ends, they're not like, you know, big lines like that, that's one less water you would have lost. So then a student intends to synthesize ester C, plan a two-stage synthesis to make this many grams starting from 2-methylpropanol. Assume that the overall percentage yield of this ester is, uh, from this ester is this. In your equation, include the mass of 2-methylpropanol required reagents and conditions and equations where appropriate. So rule number one is you've got to establish what the equation is. I don't even care about moles and all of that stuff. You need to figure out what your 
you know, your, at least what just a general equation is going to look like. If you're going to start from 2-methylpropanal, that is an aldehyde, right? So the routes you can take with 2-methylpropanal is you can turn it into a carboxylic acid, or you can go back and turn it into a primary alcohol. We need to figure out what we're going to need. So this C double bond O, O is going to come, the C double bond O bit, it's going to come from an S, uh, from a carboxylic acid, right? Can you see how that's one, two, three? That's going to be propan, oic, and then 2-methyl acid. So the original thing must have been propanoic acid, but what did we actually stick on here then? This must have come from an alcohol, because esters are made from an alcohol and carboxylic acid, right? So that must have been methanol. So what we end up getting at some point of this reaction to make this is you're going to have um, 2 methyl propanal. Like, plan out what you're going to do. 2-methyl propanal will then become 2-methyl carboxylic acid. And then when you're adding, you know, what we're going to add, CH3OH, methanol, we end up getting S to C. So that's the steps. Now that you know that this is going to need one of these to make one of these and so forth, then you can start doing all your mole rubbish, right? So I'm going to write down the steps on how to actually do this first, and then we can talk about the masses and the this and the that. So step, my first step is we've got to make this become a carboxylic acid. So I'm going to oxidize this. So you would write, you would oxidize the aldehyde to methyl propanal to 2 methyl propanoic acid, right? And the reagents you're going to use, well, the reagents are going to be acidified potassium dichromate. So the main ion we care about is Cr2, O7, 2 minus, and H plus. Those are the acidified parts. And we're going to conditions, we're going to do it under reflux, right? For the equation, it's going to be 2 methyl propanal, right? So that's going to be what CH3. There's going to be two lots of those because it's um, branched. I'm just going to do You can draw the structure as well if you want, but I'm just going to do it this way. CH, CHO, plus, when we're writing oxida oxidation equations of alcohols, we're going to add an O here. And it's going to make the same thing. So CH32, just this part's going to become CHCOOH, like that. And that's balanced. Cool. Step two is actually making the ester now. So the second step is I'm going to put our reagents together. So the reagents we figured out was that it's going to be methanol in this thing that we just made. So we're going to prepare the ester by reacting the 2-methylpropanoic uh, meth acid plus methanol. And our conditions is going to be using an acid catalyst. And this is going to be under reflux as well. So then what you end up getting is your equation is going to be the CH3 to CHCOOH plus CH3OH gives you, it's going to be this combined and boot out of water, right? So it's going to be the CH3 to COO, wait, sorry, no, CHCOOCH3, because that's the methanol part, that's the original 2-methylpropanoic acid bit, plus an H2O, right? Now, we've got that part done. We've outlined the two-stage synthesis. Done. We want to make this many grams of that starting from 2-methylpropanal. So in this thing, we want to make how many grams? 12.75 grams of this, right? So our desired amount is 12.75 grams. Uh, starting from 2-methylpropanol, and it says assume that the overall percentage yield from 2-methylpropanol is 40%. So this, this is our desired, or our actual amount, which is going to be 40% of the theoretical. Because remember that your percentage yield equals your actual over your theoretical times 100, right? So then, in your equation, include the mass of the 2-methylpropanol required as well, where appropriate. So we need to figure out how much of this we need mass-wise. Cool. So we have this, we have its MR as well by working it out, so I can work out the moles of this ester. So the moles of C is going to be 12.75 divided by its MR, which if you work out from the periodic table, it is 102. So we get 0 0.125 moles, right? But this is for 40%. Remember, the percentage yield is 40 of the theoretical, because we want to set that to be our 40%, because that's what we're going to end up making, right? We're going to lose some or not make some. So in that sense, this is for our theoretical, so we need to find out the moles of the theoretical C, right? Which would just be you rearranging this, or you could just do 0 0.125 divided by 0 0.4, which is as, as a decimal. Either way works. So if I do that, I get 0 0.3125 moles. Cool. So then you can tell, because we've written out all these equations and also sketched out there, the mole, the ratio between the, um, the 2 methylpropanal and this ester eventually is one to one. 
So therefore, the moles of the two methyl blah 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 propanal, I didn't have to actually do the blah blah blah, did I know? Whatever, is also going to be 0 0.3125 moles, right? Therefore, the mass would equal mole times MR, which is going to be um, 0 0.3125 times the MR of 2 methyl propanal, which is 72. If you do that, you end up getting 22.5 grams. There you go. Lots of people just kind of went all over the place and just jumped everywhere and then just, you know, focused only on like just the reaction parts or this or that and just didn't do much calculations. And this, that. you've got to go through it step by step. There's no way around it. And I think generally speaking, whenever you're doing a moles calculation or a mass calculation or a this or a that, you need to, need to, need to formulate an equation, even if it's just kind of sketching out like this. Because maybe if it was like, you know, two something, like for example, if you had a diol and you were oxidizing a diol, you'd have to double because you're doing two alcohol groups. It's really really important just to do that because it helps you keep in check the balancing out of things. Right, so the mass spectrum of S to C is shown below. Suggest possible structures for the species for Y and Z. So what you've got to do is you've got to go look at these um, MZ values and then figure out what they are and then just see what you could break off basically. So here that's a 71 and that is 43. So what must have happened at some point is you've got like a fragment breaking up at certain points to give you these, right? So a good start is maybe I'll say, okay, let's break this part off. So we've got CH3, CH3, C, and then H plus. They're positive, remember. If we do that, that does actually work out to be 43. And the other chunk then was probably just either, well, it can't be that because that wouldn't give you 71. So you need to figure out another way of breaking it. But we'll get to that one in a sec. Let's put the Y one down because we at least got that. That's CH3, 2, CH plus. Now the other one is at 71. We need to think of other ways we can break this off and see what we end up making. So for example, maybe I'll try breaking this up and see what it ends up making, right? If we do that, that's going to be what? 15 plus 15 plus 12 plus 1 plus 12 plus 16 plus 16. It gives us 87, but we want 71. So maybe I actually broke off here instead. If I do that, that's 71. So it's going to be this whole thing with a plus on it. So it's going to be CH32 CHCO plus like that. There you go. So this question is about benzene. Over time, Kekulé and the delocalized models have been used to describe the bonding and structure of a benzene molecule. Describe in terms of orbital overlap the similarities and differences between the bonding in the Kekulé model and the delocalized model of benzene. So let's talk about the similarities first. So if you look at our similarities, the Kekulé model was basically, here's this, right? And it was a double bond, a double bond, and a double bond. Whereas the benzene ring is actually delocalized. The thing that's common between them though is that they both have all p orbital overlap because in a CC double bond, right? If I put it over here, sorry, that's actually a C with a sigma with a normal sigma bond there with the two p orbitals like this that overlap to become that above and beyond uh, below the plane, right? Whereas here, what happens is the p orbitals in the benzene all overlap kind of like this. So what happens is you have a p orbital here, p orbital here, p orbital here. P orbital here, P orbital here, P orbital here. So this geezer was saying that these ones would overlap and then like these ones would in separate places. But the actual model that we use is that what happens is instead is that you have a ring above and beyond because they all sideways overlap like that, like this. So then a the similarity is definitely one of them immediately says that there's a sideways overlap of P orbitals. That's a definite similarity, right? And it's because, and um, in the Kekulé model, you have a pi bond right? Between, you know, like uh, between C to C, above and below the, the CC plane. And in the delocalized model, you have a pi ring or system, you know, due to the overlap above and below the plane. Like that. The difference is, however, though, is to do with their bonding. So in Kekulé's model, it had alternating double and single bonds, so alternating pi and sigma bonds, right? Whereas in the delocalized model, and add a diagram as well, I mean, I've done it there, so that helps. The delocalized model is that there is, um, you know, like the, the, all the p orbitals overlap in both directions, like that. There you go. It's only just talking about the bonding, nothing more. Experimental evidence led to the general acceptance of the delocalized model over the Kekulé model. Describe two pieces of evidence to support this. So number one is um, an easy one to get out, is that the bond length is the same throughout. So what happens, so CC bond length, you know, uh, 
is the same in benzene, right? But that's not enough because you have to explain why that's you know relevant. Um, whereas C C and you know C C uh, otherwise are different lengths, right? Another piece of evidence is you could say that the delta H of hydrogenation of you know one C C in a cyclohexene thing, right? Um, is not equal to three times, you know, this in better for, for benzene. It's actually less exothermic than expected, right? Those are the two strongest ones. As well as that, you could say that benzene is less reactive. It requires a halogen carrier catalyst. It can't just do electrophilic, um, you know, addition freely. You can't just say benzene's unreactive. That's not enough. You could also say it does not readily decolonize bromine. Uh, it reacts with substitution instead of um, addition instead. So there's a couple, a couple as well. So benzene can be used as a starting material for lots of compounds, uh, including DNA. It's shown. Benzene can be used as a starting material for the synthesis of compounds DNA shown below. In the diagram, C6H5 is a phenyl group. Compounds DNA can be converted into polymers, draw two repeat units. This is an alkyde, so it's going to make an addition polymer. So if we're drawing two repeat units, we open up that bond. C, C, H, H, and then C, 6, H, 5, and then an H, and then we're going to draw the next one next to it. So C, C, H, H. And then it's going to be C6H5 and H. Because it's saying repeat units, you're going to put those dotted lines outwards. It's not the full polymer, it's just the repeat units. Then for E, for E, what do we have here? We've got a carboxylic acid group and an amine. Immediately to you, that should ring bells that we can make an amide link. An amide link always looks like this. C double bond O and an N and an H and some amount of them, right? So what happens here is we're going to link them by that. So draw them side by side. You're going to have a C, C double bond O, N, H, and then the next one, so C, CH3, C, 6, H, 5, then a C double bond O, that's open like that, sorry, whoops, it's open like that, and then on this end, it's going to be an N, an H, and it's open like that, there you go. Then it says state the type of polymer formed from compounds D and E, so um, D is an addition polymer, or you could say polyalkene, and E is condensation, it's a condon condensation polymer, or you could say it's a polyamide. In the synthesis of compounds D and E, benzene is first reacted with ethanol chloride, CH3COCl, to make phenyl ethanol, as shown below. The reaction takes place in the presence of an aluminium chloride, AlCl3, which acts as a catalyst. In the mechanism for this reaction, ethanol chloride first reacts with aluminium chloride to form the CH3CO plus O minus, sorry, O cation. The CH3CO whatever cation behaves as an electrophile. Complete the mechanism for this reaction, include the equations for the role of the AlCl3 catalyst, relevant curly arrows, and the formation of the intermediate. So, to make the electrophile, the questions told you already what's happening and what we're making. So. An electrophile, remember, is something that is once electrons. It's attracted to electrons. It's deficient. So we've been told that we're starting with um, this acyl chloride, wherever it's gone, ethanol chloride. So write what you know. So we know it's CH3COCl, right? We know we're going to add AlCl3, and we know that we're going to make CH3C plus double bond O, right? Now, you see how that has lost a Cl, that's become positive, so it must be have a Cl minus. So what happens is you end up getting ALCl4 minus, it's gone there. Then in, that's the formation of the electrophile. Then what we need to do is we need to figure out what's happening. This is an electrophile, it's this carbon here that is, not the double bond, not the O, nothing like that. What it wants is it wants electrons, and the source of electrons is this benzene ring. So it takes electrons like that, and you draw a curly arrow showing the movement of electrons from there to there, right? The intermediate then ends up being, so you've just now made a bond with it. So then what you end up having is you've got this now C double bond, whoops, you've got a C double bond O, CH3 like this, but the issue is, is that ring is now broken because it's given electrons and it has too many bonds here. That carbon doesn't like having that many in benzene. So we need to boot something off. Our only option is to boot off an H. Now we wouldn't draw an arrow like that because that would give you H minus and that becomes two plus. What we need is we need to put the electrons back in. So the bond breaks and it gives electrons back into the ring like that. And that's how you end up with this. And then regeneration of the catalyst, well, that's AlCl4 minus now, plus this H plus. It gives you AlCl3, so we've regenerated it, plus HCl. There you go. So now it says, complete the flowchart, the synthesis of compounds DNA from phenyl ethanone. If you have a look, this is a ketone group. It's not attached here, it's a ketone group here. And if you're going to use NaBH4, it's going to put it back down to its alcohol. It's going to be reduced instead of oxidized. So you get this, you then get COH, you get CH3 here, and then you've got an H there. Cool. Then compare them side by side, right? So from here to here, what's happened is we now have no OH, and we've now got an alkene instead. So what we've done is we have dehydrated it. We've taken water out. So the way we do that is we use an acid catalyst, H3PO4, for example, or concentrated 
There you go. That's that. Then if we have a look here, we've got phenylethylene writing NACN. So we've got carbonyl, we've got a ketone and writing NACN. So to you guys, that should signal that you're going to make a hydroxy nitrile. So what you end up having is you've got your benzene's chilling here, right? This C now has a CN stuck to it, and it has an HO, like that hydroxy nitrile. Hydroxy nitrile. Then, for some reason, from here to here, something's changed. The only thing that's changed is that OH has now been swapped for a BR. So we have a nucleophilic substitution reaction where a BR minus swaps around. But in this one, you have to add a couple of the bits and bobs. So you've got to have NABR, and you have to have an acid of some sort, like H2SO4. There you go. So we've from here to here, what's changed? So we've now not got a BR there, we've got an H2N instead. And for some reason, the CN has now become a COOH. So we need to think about what we've done between these two steps. So I think the easiest step that you can do in one go is swapping the BR for NH2N via nucleophilic substitution. So we're going to use NH3 in ethanol. We don't use water because then an OH from the water would swap with it. So we use NH3 and ethanol, right? If we do that, then we end up swapping that for the NH2, that, the H2N there. So that's quite good. We want that. So then when we've done that, you've got the same thing, but now you've swapped the BR for an, NH, uh, for an NH2. So then it's going to be an H2N here. And then a CN still there, CH3. Now you've gone from a CN to a carboxylic acid. The way you go down that route is by using acid and water. So you would have H2O and um, HCl. Now with these, you can swap the steps around whichever way you want to go. So this question is about reaction mechanisms. Chemists use curly arrows in reaction mechanisms. What is the curly arrow showing? It is the movement of an electron pair. Movement of electron pair. There you go. Draw structures to show the products in the reaction of this mechanism below. So what the style of this question is that they will give you an unfamiliar mechanism and then tell you to do something with it, and that's why you can't just sit and memorize things, right? So let's have a think what's going on. Remember that this is an electron pair in a covalent bond between a carbon and an oxygen. That pair is going here to this oxygen, so that means this bond breaks. So what we end up having is we've got this thing here, but this has now lost a pair of electrons there, so it's positive with this, and that's now gotten like the electrons it needs and it's happy, so it's now going to be this separate thing on its own H2O, like that. Now it says use this mechanism to explain what is meant by heterolytic fission. So heterolytic in this, me in this sense means that one of the bonded atoms gets two electrons, in this case it's oxygen. So heterolytic, uh, you need to, so heterolytic is that one atom gets both e electrons in the covalent bond, which is here, it's going to be oxygen, right? And the fission part is breaking of a covalent bond. You have to say the covalent bond part. You can't just say breaking of a bond. That's not very helpful. So now it says an incomplete mechanism is shown below. Complete the mechanism by adding curly arrows and any missing species. So again, let's have a look what's going on. Compare them side by side. You see this double bond O has now become an O minus. So already I know that one thing that's definitely happened is an electron you know, pairs moved from there to there to give you this. However, you can now see this carbon's got an OH on it as well. And here's the OH. So it must have given its electrons to this carbon, which would be delta positive as well because of the fact that there's no oxygen there, right? Now step here to here, what's different? Well, you can see that this has now become a double bond again, which means electrons has come into here and this is no longer charged on that side. So the electrons must have gone back into this like that. But however, you can see here there's a COH and H3C in this and there's no Cl, so Cl's gone. And also this is unhappy anyway as is because if you had a double bond there, there'd be five bonds around that carbon. So you need to boot off the Cl. Now you wouldn't do it that way, otherwise this would have too many electrons. It would be something minus because it's got a double bond as well. It's going to be this way and boot itself like that. Now if that's the case, we've now got a Cl minus here as well, like that. So it says, what's the role of the OH minus in this mechanism then? So if we have a look at what's going on, this OH minus is giving an electron pair to this electron deficient carbon. It is attracted to something that is deficient in electrons, it's more positive, and a nucleus is positive. So because it's donating an electron pair, it is a nucleophile. There you go. So analysis of an unknown organic compound gave you these results. Here's its elemental analysis by mass, mass spectrum, and then it's got a proton and a mass spectrum, and the numbers by the peaks of the relative peak areas. Use your reasonings, so use your results to suggest one possible structure and show all your reasoning. Do not jump back and forth. Work through it step by step, get all the pieces, and you'll be chilling. A lot of people, what I see is they'll just go back and forth and they'll panic and then be like, okay, I've done this, I've done this, I see peaks here, and that's it. It's like, I'm not going to look at this, and I'm not going to look at this yet, because I'm going to go in order which is pretty safe to do and pretty helpful. Loads of people just kind of write all over stuff like that. Whenever you do this, you need to have all of the clues in there for you to use to then decide what's going on. But you also need to so, you know, show your reasoning on what you're doing. So we can see, first of all, we have an elemental analysis by mass. This is useful because we can work out its empirical formula. 
right? So how we work the empirical formula is you would write out the ratio of C to H to O. We know there's 73.17 of this percent. There's 7.32 of this H, and there's 19.51 percent of that. Divided by 12, divided by 1, divided by 16, and then you work out the smallest ratio. So you get 6.10 to 7.32 to um, 1.22, divided by the smallest number, and eventually it becomes 5 to 6 to 1, right? So then we now know its empirical formula is C5H6O, which is like the cancelled down formula. For example, if I have like C2H6, you can empirical, uh, empirical formula it down to CH3, right? So then what we need to do is we need to check this MZ and this. So the empirical formula is MR is going to be whatever that adds up to, which is going to be uh, 5 lots of 12 plus 6 plus a 16, which gives you 82. However, the question's told you that it has an MZ peak at 164. So an MZ at 164 means that it's two times the empirical formula, C5H6O. So therefore, we now know it's molecular formula. The molecular formula is now going to be C10H12O2. That's our first piece of evidence we're going to use. Next, I've dealt with all of you, dealt with all of you. Cool. Next, let's look at the IR spectrum and work by bit by bit. So now, if we have a look at our IR spectrum, I'm not going to just have a copy of the data sheet out here. I don't have enough space to put it in, and then you'll be able to do the whole question. We can see immediately that there's like a peak at around, you know, this fatty bit here, right? And we can see that's like what, like 2,300 ish to about 3,600, right? So say that, say there's a peak at around 2,300 to 3,700. And if we look at our data sheet, the one that it fits is a carboxylic acid. So you would say OH in a carboxylic acid. You need to show your reasoning, otherwise you don't get marks. You can't just say anything. And then as well as that, there's one at about 1700 as well. So 1700, and that's going to be a C double bond O as well. So therefore, the other piece of evidence we now have is that it's going to most likely be a carboxylic acid, is what we're dealing with. Now you can go and look at the dreaded NMR spectrum that everyone just kind of scared of because they just jump back and forth and it's really annoying, right? There's a couple things to this, right? First thing is, Number one, get all the pieces of the puzzle, then draw everything together. But don't even look at the, these numbers yet until you've figured out the properties of every single peak. First off, we know that this has been run in D2O, all right? So if it's in D2O, then that means that your OHs have been removed. Because if you see, OH and NH have these very long shifts there across the entire thing. You don't know if any of these peaks could be this or this. So the fact they've run it in D2O means that we've lost the OH peak that would have come up. So that's fine. Now, one by one, go through them. So if you look at the peak at 1. Point, what's that? 1.5 ppm, write out its properties first. It's got an area of three, so that means it's going to have three hydrogens. We know it's a doublet too. So then the adjacent carbon has one hydrogen, right? Then go and get what it is in the data sheet. So here, the data sheet is showing it's this, and can you see how that one's bold? So that means that this environment is picked up with a three times. So there's going to be three of them, and the adjacent is going to have one. So this piece here has to be, and draw the piece out, H, C, H, H, and it's bonded to a C with only one hydrogen on it. These are some other things that could go there, right? That's our first one. The next peak is at like, what, 2.3 ppm. So that 2.3 ppm, again, same strategy. I, can you see I've not even looked at the sheet yet to figure out what it is? I'm just collecting what I need first. We know it's an area of three, so there's three hydrogens, and we know it's a singlet. Fine, now I'm gonna go look at the data, has one hydrogen. Our options are that it's the HC, C double bond or whatever, or HCN, so it's not gonna be that because there's no N in it. There may be benzene in this for all we know, we don't know. So, could be this, right? So if it's got an area of three, then we know it's um, gonna be CH3 bonded to either a benzene ring or this. So that's not helpful just yet. So H, C, C, H, right? And it could be bonded to either this C double bond O or a benzene. Don't know yet. Cool. Next, if we have a look at the one that's at 2.6 ppm, we know it's an area of one, so there's one hydrogen. It's a quartet, so the adjacent carbon has three hydrogens. And then if we actually look at what it is in the data sheet, so three, sorry, 2.7 is what? This again, or it could be this. Now, here, it most likely would be, so it's a, well, it's a quartet, Jason has three hydrogens, right? So it's got an area of one and it's one hydrogen. So we know it's gonna be C with one hydrogen on it, right? So it's adjacent to this carbon, not that one, 
that's not the adjacent to this hydrogen. So here it's going to be this with one. The adjacent carbon's got three hydrogens on it, like this, right? And um, it's going to everyone dealt with that. Jason's got that. And it's going to be next to a C double bond O, whatever, right? Or it could be the benzene as well. Don't know yet. We'll come back to that in a sec. Fine. Now we can move on to the next one, which is at, what's that? Seven point something. So there's a peak at 7.1 to 7.5 ppm, right? Now, if I just move down a bit here, we know that it is a, an area of four. So there's four hydrogens we know that it's going to be a multiplet. So it's hard to tell what the adjacent number of carbons are on the hydrogens, but whatever, no big deal, right? Now, if you look at the data sheet, that falls within the benzene range, and it's this hydrogen here that's been picked up. So what we have is we've got a benzene here with four hydrogens on it, and two of them have been swapped. Cool. So then what you do is once you've grabbed all of this stuff, you then put the pieces of the puzzle together. What I mean by that is we now know overall we have Usually I always do this first, and for some reason I've just fumbled horrendously and the not, right? The clusters of peaks that you have in the number of hydrogen environments is one, two, three, four, five. So we actually have five hydrogen environments as well that I've completely just forgotten to do, and I usually do always do that first. Shocking that I didn't do it first this time. Anyways, so back to this. We know it's going to have this. We know it's got five hydrogen environments. We know it has a COOH in it, and we know that these are the pieces it has in the puzzle. So then all you do is you just glue everything together and see what you end up making, right? So we've got a benzene ring in this, no doubt. And we know that four of those hydrogens have been swapped out. Within that benzene ring, you can see that there are two clusters of peaks, which means there's got to be two hydrogen environments within the benzene ring itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw something that gives this two. So I might draw it on its side instead just to make it a bit easier to visualize, right? If I put something here in here, then that's going to be one hydrogen environment, that's going to be another, that's going to be another, that's going to be another, but these two are going to be identical. These two are going to be identical. So that gives you those two hydrogen environments. Most likely, whatever this mysterious thing is here is going to be like that, if that makes sense. So now I've knuckled down on what the benzene part is. We've kind of dealt with you, so we're happy there. Now we need to figure out where all the other pieces go. So if we look here again, we had a CH3, and the adjacent carbon has one hydrogen. Fine. Anywhere we can put that. Can't really put it anywhere on this benzene. So what I might do is I might put the CH3, well, the adjacent carbon with its one hydrogen here and a CH3 there, like that. That fits. That's pretty all right. So that's done. If we have a look here, we've got a CH3, which is either on a C double bond or a benzene, right? Now, we also have a C double bond here with a CH and a CH3. We can't have two of them. We can only have one C double bond O's, right? So it's most likely that this one fits the benzene, and that's a CH3 and a benzene. So then I could put the CH3 here, right? And that one's done. All we're left with now is, well, we've reused one, two, uh, three, four, five, seven. We've used eight carbons. We still need to put a carbo carboxylic acid group somewhere on here as well. We've used nine carbons, and we're still missing a carboxylic acid group. Only thing that's left is that carboxylic acid group. So C double bond O, O, H. There's no OH peak, remember, because it's been put in D2O. So then what you do is you work out the number of hydrogen environments and see if it fits it. So here, there's going to be three. If I just draw this in full, right? So H, H, H. There's one. This is the same as that one. That's one. So these are all one environment. Here, there's going to be two, because that's a CH, remember? That's the same as that one, two. Three here, three here. And then there's no hydrogen to that one. Here, that's four. That one's going to be, remember, this, there's three of them. So that's like, if I draw that out again, here, like that. That's going to be a different environment, but can you see how they're all the same to each other? So five by five. And then we've got six. Now, there's five hydrogen environments. Remember that one of the D2Os is removed? And that fits the bill, because that would have been the extra one there. So there you go. That's how you do it. Bish bash bosh. If you can't do this final step, at least do all of the steps leading up to it, because then you can get like about four-ish marks easy off the bat, as long as you do it properly and systematically. But these questions really aren't too spicy. It's just using all the information like that. Anyway, I hope that helped. Please like, share, and subscribe. You know the drill, and thank you.